Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I think you've got some uh, running commentary from uh, Fergus there, Fergus the Cat. <laughs> uh, welcome to another live stream here from the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. I'm Kyle Dalton, the uh, Membership and Development Coordinator. Uh, we're going to be talking today about germ theory. There's a few things that I want to go over before we, uh, we really get started in that. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to everybody joining us from around the country and around the world. We've had viewers from Ireland, Germany, Russia, uh, Canada, and throughout the United States. Uh, <laughs> I see we've got uh, other cats watching as well. Uh, <laughs> so again, thank you all so much for tuning in. It means a lot to us to know that our work is, is still being appreciated out there. We've had some recent uh, new members. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, the best way, of course, to support these broadcasts is to become a member. It may be a while. Nobody really knows, of course, when this is going to end. But when we do open up, uh, that's the best way to make sure that, that we're ready for a post-pandemic world. Uh, you can come and visit all three sites with your membership, get discounts on uh, gift shops. And, of course, for now, to keep you busy, when you become a member, I send out some membership cards and the latest version of the journal and newsletter. We got another uh, journal coming up uh, in, I think, a couple of months. Uh, when you become a member, you automatically get subscribed to that, no matter what your membership level. You'll find the link in the description here. Uh, so again, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you so much for your support. I want to remind you that our mission here at the museum is to utilize artifacts, storytelling, and the historic lessons derived from the Civil War to educate the public and define the impact on today's society. In short, we look at healthcare on the front lines in the 1860s and try to make it relevant to now. Uh, and of course, that's a really important message right now. Uh, I said this in my last video, but this healthcare crisis isn't completely unprecedented. Uh, we've seen things like this in the past, and by examining the successes and the failures of the past, we can inform the present. That helps to give us hope. So uh, I, I'm glad you can all join us. I'm glad you all can support that for us. Uh, and be sure to keep an eye on our Facebook page and uh, on our website. Uh, we do update occasionally about what videos are coming up. We've got another one tomorrow. Uh, we have one on, uh, on Monday. So, so be sure to keep an eye on that. There's, there's plenty more to see. And also, if you share this video and you like this video, it helps to s other people to see it, even people who aren't your friends on Facebook. Uh, that helps to, to spread the message, to expose it to more people. So be sure to share it or like it. Uh, all of your comments certainly help. Well, we're glad again to see all of you out there. Um, so hello everybody. Hello Domins. Nice to see you coming in from the from Illinois. Lorianne from Florida. Uh, we had a couple of San Diegans in here. I'm from San Diego originally, so it's nice to see uh, some of that uh, in there. Um, Patricia from uh, Biglerville, Pennsylvania. Uh, she's our newest member, by the way. Thank you so much, Patricia, for, for joining us, for, for supporting this very important message. And thank you, Fergus, for the running commentary. That's Fergus the cat. You'll hear him throughout the video. <laughs> um, so throughout the live stream, as, as I always do with these, I'm going to answer the questions that you ask. So feel free to ask at any time. Uh, I may answer it uh, over the course of this. If, if I don't, when I get to the end of, of this pre-prepared script, I'll answer any questions that I can. But it's important to remember that I'm not a medical professional. <laughs> I am a public historian. I'm trained in, in museum stuff. Uh, I'm not a pathologist. I'm not a virologist. Uh, I'm not a biologist. So it, it's important to remember that this is a historical lesson. This is not medical advice. Nothing we say in these videos should ever be taken as medical advice. Uh, so, so remember that. Um, also, for the purposes of today's presentation, germ theory is a huge topic. I can't possibly cover all of it. Uh, so um, I'm going to be focusing mainly on the European tradition of medicine. Uh, a couple of reasons for that. Number one, that's what the uh, surgeons, the doctors, the physicians of the Civil War were directly inheriting. They were of the European tradition. The other thing is that if I tried to cover all of that, I wouldn't have enough time here. There's, there's just too much. To cover. So I've chosen to focus on the European tradition of, of germ theory and medicine. Um, but I do encourage you to check out some of the other uh, traditions. Uh, ancient India, it, it may have been where the very first germ theory originated well before uh, the European tradition. So be sure to check that out on your own, but I'm afraid I don't really have time to do that. We want to keep it as relevant 
to the civil war as, as we can. Uh, and again, they're coming from a European tradition, so that's what I'm going to focus on. Uh, so with that said, let's get to it. I want to start with this quote by Edward Dolnick. Uh, he did a biography of Sir Isaac Newton called The Clockwork Universe. It's a really good read. I do recommend it. Um, but he says, if Shakespeare had not lived, we would not have to be or not to be. If Einstein had, li had not lived, we might have had to wait a few years for E equals MC square. He's not saying this to denigrate the work of Einstein. He's making a broad statement about the history of science. He continues, every great scientist from Galileo to Darwin to Einstein had rivals at his heels. Science and medicine are often about discovery rather than invention. Uh, Galileo did not invent heliocentrism. He didn't make the earth revolve around the sun. Darwin didn't invent evolution. Uh, Einstein didn't enforce a speed limit on light. Those were all things that were already existing. They were already there. It was a matter of finding it. So all these scientists revealed perpetual truths about our world and the universe had continued to exist as it always had. We were really just tapping into uh, what was already there. We were uncovering these universal truths. This puts us in the right frame of mind to explore the most devastating unintentional weapon of the Civil War, disease. It's often been said, including by us, that germ theory didn't exist in the Civil War. And that's broadly true, but germs did exist, whether or not we acknowledge that they were there. Just as the Earth spins around the sun, or gravity pulls you toward the Earth, uh, or the plates of the Earth move under our feet, bacteria and viruses were present in the 1860s, as present as they'd ever been, and as present as they are today. Whether or not we acknowledge that they were there, they were there and they were causing the diseases that claimed the lives of so many Americans. The issue is that they just weren't fully understood. The Civil War is a period of transition in many ways, uh, technologically most obviously. Uh, you have steamships that are plated with iron that have no sails, uh, that are directly fighting old-timey sail ships, uh, the Cumberland and the Merrimack, for example. Uh, you have muzzle-loading rifles operating on the same battlefields as Gatling guns, as machine guns. Uh, you have trains and horses. Uh, these are, this is a period of transition where a lot of things are changing. And that's true in the study of medicine as well. Uh, you're seeing the culmination of germ theory. The Civil War is a transition period where germ theory is in its infancy. It's just being developed. It's just starting to formulate. Uh, and so they hadn't really accepted it yet. They hadn't really understood it yet. It didn't really work yet. And that had devastating consequences. Through ignorance of uh, the causes of disease, physicians of the time uh, were incapable of effectively fighting it. Uh, as Michael Flannery wrote in his book, A History of Drugs, in the, Drugs and Pharmaceuticals in the Civil War. Uh, Michael Flannery has a, a number of good books, by the way. Be sure to check our, our um, blogs. We, we reference him a few times. Nomenclature then is not nomenclature now. Virus and bacteria do appear in primary sources. A virus, however, was not understood as a microbe smaller than a bacterium capable of replicating and causing serious illness. It was simply seen as a poison, and perhaps vaguely and non-specifically an agent for disease transmission. Bacteria were known, but were just one broad group of microscopic animalcule, uh, animalcule rather. Uh, so really, they, they knew that viruses and germs were a thing, but they, they didn't know exactly what they were. The connection between them and disease was not firmly established. It hadn't been tested, it hadn't been proven. Uh, there were some early ideas of this, we'll get into that, um, but short version is they're just not quite there yet. In short, disease is a major killer of the Civil War and one that, if we had only known, would have been entirely preventable. This was an era of impressive innovations in medicine. Medical evacuation systems, widespread use of anesthesia, which was itself a uh, invention of the Americans, uh, invaluable surgical experience. All of these things rightly made American doctors proud of their accomplishments. They were among the best doctors in the world, if not the best doctors in the world. But this confidence was a double-edged sword. 
it led to a rejection of germ theory in the aftermath of the Civil War. Uh, I speak in broad general terms here. Most American surgeons were not willing to buy into germ theory in the years after the Civil War. Uh, this extended the death well beyond the end of the conflict in 1866. Many preventable deaths continued to occur because of the rejection of the science. In order for us to address the history of germs, and I've done a little bit of this already, we've got to define what that means. The term germ refers to a microorganism that causes disease. Uh, there are actually several different categories of this. Uh, oftentimes in uh, lay terms, uh, lay, a virus and bacteria are used interchangeably, but those are actually two different things. A virus, uh, like COVID-19, uh, they're smaller than bacteria. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, by replicating inside the body of the host, they cause illness. Uh, but importantly, viruses must be inside a living thing to survive. They've got to be inside a living creature. The term virus was first used in 1728, well before the Civil War, uh, almost as far from the Civil War as we are today. Uh, they used it to describe something that causes a disease, an agent of disease. But it wasn't until the 1880s that viruses were identified as microorganisms or that they were strongly linked to disease. Uh, and that was by the German doctor Robert uh, Koch. Uh, he is the one who, who advances the most successful and modern germ theory of the 19th century. So during the Civil War, uh, the most significant viruses are smallpox and measles. And we'll talk a little bit more about smallpox uh, later on. But um, measles is also one of the few uh, diseases that there's a vaccine for in the Civil War. Uh, so the soldiers themselves don't suffer as much from smallpox as they had in previous conflicts, like the Revolutionary War. Uh, there was a major smallpox epidemic then, but uh, the vaccine that existed in the Civil War helped to fight that. Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't true for everybody, but we'll, we'll talk about that later on. So those are examples of viruses. The next big one is bacteria. Bacteria are single-celled or organisms uh, that, unlike uh, viruses, can survive outside uh, the body. Uh, so they can be transferred uh, that way. Uh, many are harmless. Uh, some are even beneficial. All of us have bacteria in our stomachs, for example, to help us uh, to digest. Um, but there are some that, as we all know, are dangerous. Uh, cholera being a big example of this. Cholera was very prevalent at the time, uh, and in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, there was a worldwide pandemic. started in India uh, or the Middle East, one of the two, and it spread across the globe. Uh, and that was kind of a one-two punch for American medicine. There was the Civil War, and then there was a major cholera epidemic afterward. Another major bacterial infection of the war uh, was typhoid. Uh, with a near 33% mortality rate. One in three people died if they contracted typhoid. Uh, this led to 65,000 dead soldiers north and south. Uh, so this is, this is a major uh, problem. Viruses and bacteria are, are major killers of the war. Protozoa are another form of, uh, of germ. Uh, protozoa are one cell organisms and they spread specifically through water. Uh, the most deadly disease of the Civil War is dysentery. Uh, dysentery was by far the biggest killer of the war. Above all other weapons, above all other diseases, 100,000 soldiers die from dysentery. And that's not even counting the civilians that, that it contracted it as well. Uh, these numbers are, are difficult to track, of course, but we know that this is the most significant killer of the war. These come from, in two different forms. There's bacillary dysentery, that's bacteria, uh, from the Shigella, Shigella? I may be pronouncing that wrong, bacteria. Uh, and there's amoebic dysentery. That's a protozoa, so that's spread specifically through water. Uh, and uh, dysentery, uh, it's hard to say which of these two forms was uh, the, the more prevalent because they didn't know that there were two forms of dysentery back then. All dysentery was classed as just dysentery. They didn't know that it was bacterial and amoebic. So we don't know which of these was more prevalent, but we can say that filthy conditions leads to this. Contaminated water leads to this. There were some doctors, especially in Europe, who understood that before the Civil War began. Uh, but again, it, it took a while for that to catch on, and the Americans were even slower than many of their European counterparts. Uh, there's also fungi. Uh, fungi are usually, uh, many of them, uh, I'm not sure if usually, but many fungi are harmless. Uh, they are multi-celled organisms. So unlike all the other categories, protozoa, uh, amoebic, uh, or, or rather um, bacterial, 
uh, and um, viruses, these are multi-celled organisms. Uh, they're plant-like. Uh, mushrooms are a form of fungi. Uh, and I don't know of, of any major diseases from the Civil War that come from fungal infections, uh, but it is possible. Uh, in a 2018 paper submitted by a team of military doctors to the Journal of Military Medicine, they found that uh, blast wounds treated at just one medical center uh, from 2010 to 2012 during the invasion of Iraq uh, incurred invasive fungal infections at a rate of 10 to 12 percent, sometimes resulting in amputation. And that's today. That's with modern medicine uh, and very quick treatment. Blast wounds would infect them uh, with fungi. Uh, so this is very possible, uh, something that could have happened during the Civil War, and we just wouldn't have any evidence for it. They wouldn't know what to be looking for, and that evidence wouldn't survive to be studied by subsequent generations. So those are the four forms of, of infection, of uh, uh, germs, fungi, protozoa, bacteria, and virus. Uh, and all of them play a role to a, a greater or lesser degree throughout the conflict. This brings us to another point about germ theory and the Civil War, is that uh, we often separate infections from uh, wounds, from, from deaths by, by wounds and subsequent infections that come from there. Disease and battlefield casualties both were affected by germs, uh, by failing to clean their instruments, by not having a germ theory to operate off of. Surgery often resulted in infection, and that could prove fatal in itself, uh, or it could lead to subsequent amputation. Uh, surgeons would try to get ahead of a infection by amputating further and further up a limb. Uh, so s soldiers, even if they survived the infection, could lose quite a bit more than they would today because there was no germ theory articulated in America. Without germ theory, physicians really struggled to explain and to treat diseases. The dominant theory in the centuries leading up to the Civil War was miasma. Uh, miasma is the idea that there's a noxious or poisonous cloud, an invisible air that you breathe in and that's what infects you. Uh, and it's not exactly true. Uh, there are, um, you know, we wear masks today when we go to stores or if you're working at an essential business to prevent spreading of germs when, uh, when fluid leaves your mouth or nose uh, because those carry the germs with them. Uh, so this is you know, kind of a weird articulation of that. They didn't fully understand where that was coming from. Uh, but there, it's coming from somewhere. They understand that people are getting disease from something they can't see. Uh, it still doesn't fully explain how disease works. And uh, so researchers and surgeons were going in the wrong direction, trying to figure out how to prevent and cure diseases. And this theory had been questioned basically from the beginning, uh, going all the way back to ancient Athens. Thucydides, uh, during the Peloponnesian War, observed an outbreak of plague. Uh, now, this may not have been the bubonic plague. It might have been something like smallpox. Point is, he was watching this major outbreak, and he saw that there were things that didn't line up with miasma theory. Uh, the first was contagion, that people were getting sick by being around other people who were sick. That doesn't really flow with the miasma theory. If you're removed from the environmental factor, if you're removed from the thing that is poisoning you, then you shouldn't be getting sick. So being around other people proved contagion, pathogen, uh, was being passed back and forth. Uh, so that was a big one. That, that really threw miasma theory for a loop. And there was no one who could really explain that until about the 1860s, uh, 1870s. Uh, so he's the first one to really raise that concern, the idea that this doesn't work. The problem is that when uh, you're looking at the history of medicine, very often, it's not just saying this theory doesn't make sense, it's offering another theory that does. And people aren't able to do that. There's no technology to do that for centuries, uh, millennia, really, if we're going back to Thucydides. They just don't know why it's happening. They can say, well, what you're saying doesn't make sense, but ultimately, you've got to have something to go off of. Uh, so, for a long time, many people raised doubts about miasma theory, but it was the best thing that they had. Uh, they knew that, they, that there was some way that this was being passed, uh, presumably through the air, uh, and maybe separating them from that environmental factor, from that contagion, would, would preserve them. And it, it could, sometimes. Uh, but it wasn't treating the underlying problem. There was someone who did get weirdly close about five centuries after Thucydides. There's the Roman poet Lucretius. 
And he wrote a very long, rambling, didactic poem called On the Nature of Things, in which he tried to explain the universe. He was the chief know-it-all of the classical world. And in this, he says, uh, as we breathe, we inhale the air mingled with the seeds of disease. So he's getting real close. He knows that it's not poisonous gas, exactly. It's something in the gas, something we can't see, something invisible. The problem for uh, ancient uh, scientists is, again, he's not really offering any way to prove that. There's no scientific evidence for it. And it's also buried in a single paragraph on a single of thousands of pages. Uh, and it's, it's a lot uh, to dig through, and it's very easily forgotten. Uh, so Lucretius kind of hits the nail on the head almost by accident. Uh, and, and it's really not given much credence from there on through uh, the scientific world. Uh, it wasn't really until the 17th century that the evidence starts to gather. Uh, this is when, in the uh, 16, mid-1600s, uh, you see a major development in the microscope. Microscopes are becoming more powerful. Uh, they're, they're much easier to get. Uh, and so scientists start examining them, examining the microscopic world. Uh, in the 1640s and 1650s, a German Jesuit priest named Athanasius Kircher, I hope I didn't butcher that name. I know we have some Germans that watch occasionally. Sorry if I did. Uh, Athanasius Kircher uh, identified microorganisms in the blood of infected patients. So he directly observed the uh, germs that were causing disease in the bloodstream. Uh, he appears to have been the first to direct, directly link microorganisms to the cause of disease. Uh, for centuries after that, scientists uh, advanced this theory, but it didn't really gain traction until the 19th century. This may be partly because uh, that explanation doesn't really offer you a lot of options for treating or preventing disease. It just says, well, this causes it, but it doesn't give you any tools to do anything about it. Uh, as early as 1849, though, the English physician John Snow does start to do something about it. He's advancing his own version of germ theory, uh, specifically to combat cholera. You remember I mentioned cholera earlier. Uh, and five years later, uh, 1854, he effectively proves his theory by successfully ending a cholera outbreak in Soho, a neighborhood in London. Uh, he identified its cause as contaminated water at the now famous Broad Street Pump. So importantly, someone is putting germ theory into practice and succeeding before the Civil War. Unfortunately, he's not very good at articulating why that worked, uh, and the scientific community is largely against his ideas anyway. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is. That's a theme you're going to see uh, for a long time. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, there are people who have versions of germ theory before the Civil War, putting it into practice, and saving lives. This is a pattern that persists for the next few decades, through the Civil War, really. Compelling evidence from throughout Europe is slowly starting to pile up but was not yet gathered into a comprehensive, well-tested, and popular theory. Uh, these are often sort of seen as one-offs, like the Broad Street Pump. Uh, and at the Broad Street Pump, Jon Snow, to, uh, to get the uh, pump shut down to save lives, uh, also began using um, other theories that he didn't believe, because he knew they would be more accepted. For him, the immediate prevention of death was more important than proving his theory. Uh, so this also goes to another thing. The implications of germ theory are enormous. If you accept that germ theory is real and a real thing, then doctors would have to reconcile the fact that their ignorance, understandable or otherwise, killed countless people. That by not preventing disease, by, by not cleaning their instruments, by not washing their hands, they themselves were the agents of death. That's a hard thing for anybody to accept, much less somebody whose entire life is built around saving lives. So it makes sense that, that people were a little reluctant about this. It would also require a complete restructuring of the medical establishment. Everything you do, every step you take would have to change. Every hospital would have to be rethought. It would require a public awareness campaign. People in general would have to accept that. They'd have to change the way they live their daily lives. 
Uh, this requires political will and political action so that you have other places that could be contagion, uh, contagious spots, hot spots, uh, that would either be shut down or would have to undergo uh, some sort of regulation to prevent you from spreading disease even further. Uh, this is a societal change on a monumental scale. It's a lot to ask. So it's understandable that people are saying, we need to know for sure this is real before we do anything about it. Uh, but again, this is years of countless preventable deaths. And this leads directly into the Civil War. There are some voices in America that are speaking up on behalf of cleanliness, on behalf of hy hygienic practices, uh, and, and sort of proto-versions of germ theory. Uh, so, for example, t uh, Dr. Thomas Dent Mütter uh, of the Mütter Museum fame, uh, with all the crazy, awesome collections. There's a really great museum up there. When this is all over, we, we should all go up there. It's really cool. Uh, but Dr. Thomas Dent Mütter was a renowned surgeon, a professor at Jefferson Medical College. Uh, and he was an early proponent for cleanliness. He was very much into um, hygiene, into keeping spaces clean. Uh, so it's, there are people who are kind of advancing that, but he didn't have germ theory exactly. He wasn't articulating that microorganisms were the cause and that's why we're staying clean. Nonetheless, it has an effect. Any effort at cleanliness is going to be an improvement over being dirty. Uh, Example of this, Colonel uh, Daniel Leisure uh, commanded the 100th Pennsylvania Infantry. Uh, they fought through all five years of the conflict. They saw a lot of combat. They took 224 uh, casualties, deaths more specifically, among their officers and men in combat. By contrast, over all five of those years, the entire regiment lost only 185 men which is a pretty low rate and pretty unusual. Even combat heavy units, units that see a lot of fighting, um, they tend not to have more deaths from combat than from disease. This is the opposite. Pennsylvania is seeing the opposite. And a lot of that is because Colonel Leisure, before the war, was a doctor. He was a trained physician. Uh, specifically, he trained uh, under Dr. Mütter at Thomas Jefferson College. Uh, so he's applying these techniques, he's applying these ideas, and they're working. Uh, Pennsylvania, uh, as a state, uh, is almost an even split between battle casualties and casualties from disease. Uh, one uh, scientific author suggests that, uh, or scientific historian, I should say, suggests that the reason for that is that other Pennsylvania regiments picked up on what Colonel Leisure was doing in Hunter, Pennsylvania. Uh, so you are seeing some of this working out. You're seeing some of these things coming through. In a similar case that's also illustrative, uh, Dr. Middleton Goldsmith experimented with a form of disinfectant during his time of service with the Army of the Cumberland. Uh, mortality rates from hospital gangrene were very high during the Civil War. Uh, many people who contracted it died from it, I think around 43%. Uh, this was a very high mortality rate. Uh, but he was able to bring that mortality rate from about 43% to under 3%. And he did that using a substance called bromine. He would treat uh, hospital gangrene with bromine, and that effectively was an antiseptic movement. Uh, it, it helped to kill off the germs that were there in the putrefying flesh uh, and saved many lives. Uh, this was very uh, popular in the North at the time. Uh, his accomplishment was, was well recognized. Uh, the U.S. Army Medical Department published a book about it that he wrote uh, describing his use of bromine. Uh, you can see that, uh, again, when this is all over. Come to our location in Frederick. Uh, we have that book on display, one of the original printings from 1863. Uh, a lifesaver, literal lifesaver. Uh, but again, he couldn't really explain why it worked. Uh, to uh, paraphrase here, um, he says, uh, surgeons should waive all considerations as to the personality of the virus. Basically, don't worry about what causes it. This fixes it. Just focus on the fix. Uh, in that case, it worked. People did it. Uh, and it saved, again, many lives. Uh, unfortunately, most officials were not astute about cleanliness. Certainly, the camps themselves were disgusting, especially at the beginning of the war. And it's not like cleanliness and hygienic practices didn't exist. Uh, as early as the Revolutionary War, you've got General Washington, Baron von Steuben, writing about where to place the latrines, how to keep the streets of the camp clean. Uh, but much of this is just not being practiced in the Civil War. It's an unusually dirty time uh, in the camps. 
Uh, hospitals are cleaner. They're not disgusting, but they're not antiseptic, and that's a big difference. Uh, so, for example, 1862, uh, the Hospital Steward's Manual is written by Dr. J.J. Woodward, uh, and he's a, a big figure in Civil War medicine. Uh, in this book, there are about 40 references to cleanliness. He's saying, clean this, clean that. Uh, this includes instructions on cleaning eating utensils, pharmaceutical supplies, bed sheets, floors, practically everything. And he goes really into detail on cleaning and maintaining the surgical instruments. But it's, again, not antiseptic. It's clean, but it's not antiseptic. You're going to have more survival in Civil War general hospitals behind the lines uh, because they're clean. But it's not as high as it could be because they're not antiseptic. So, for example, he says uh, that uh, if you didn't maintain the instruments, they would be unfit for service. They would be dull saws. They would be rusted Catlin knives, uh, that kind of thing. But he doesn't make any connection at all between cleanliness and disease. He just says, keep it clean because that's professional and your instruments are going to last longer. Uh, he also says that uh, the, the stewards should be cleaning these instruments with tepid water, that hot water is bad for the handles. Hot water, of course, is what you should be washing with. It's what you should wash everything with. Uh, and the handles, one of the reasons that they, they are susceptible to uh, hot water damaging them is because they're made of wood. Wood is porous. Uh, porous uh, wood is going to hold on to germs. It's going to spread germs. Uh, so the instruments themselves are not antiseptic, even if you are cleaning them. Uh, and the steward isn't getting them until the surgeon is finished with them. Uh, or, or as uh, Woodward writes in the manual, after the surgeon has done with them. Uh, so it could be that they're not being cleaned between operations. It could be that they're being used on subsequent patients with the same bloods and fluids. Uh, an easy way to spread disease. So yeah, it's, it's not ideal. They're cleaning, but they're not antiseptic. So you've got filthy camps, you've got clean but not antiseptic hospitals. This is a, a disaster. Uh, disease understandably kills far more people than, than bullets. What you're hearing right now is my cat who's crawled into the box under the uh, computer here. <laughs> Sorry, just a second. <laughs> Come on, buddy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Come here, pal. Come on. Okay, it's not that loud. All right, he's, he's starting to... Okay. <laughs> Sorry for the uh, halftime show there, folks. <laughs> All right, where were we? Oh, yeah. Death. All right. <laughs> oh, all right. So um, the consequences of these understandable failures are pretty easy to see. Uh, massive uh, casualties of the Civil War, most of them coming from disease. Uh, and these did motivate some of the surgeons to immediately adopt germ theory when germ theory is advanced in America. A uh, good example of this, Dr. George Derby of the 23rd Massachusetts, uh, surgeon of the 23rd Massachusetts, uh, argued that the casualties of the war proved the value of hygiene. Uh, death by disease, he wrote, was the direct and logical consequence of the rules of hygienic science as applied to war. So he's saying directly, the death of the Civil War proves that we need to clean things up. But for most surgeons, uh, it was the scale of death in the Civil War that pushed the other direction. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the main things that surgeons were worried about in the Civil War, one of the main things, or, or about germ theory rather, one of the main things that made them uh, not want to accept germ theory was the implication that they themselves were the carriers of disease and death, that they were the ones who were contagious. Uh, and so that's a lot especially for these guys who've been through the most momentous conflict, the most destructive conflict in American history. Uh, one surgeon I was reading this morning described his hands being wrinkled like a washerwoman's from the blood of surgery during the war. Uh, these men had seen a lot of things, things that they would never forget, that would stick with them forever, a trauma that we find a little easier to, uh, to identify today. And so the idea that not only were they not helping as much as they thought, but that they were actively killing their patients through their ignorance uh, is, is a lot to ask them to swallow. So American doctors especially were not open to germ theory in the years after the Civil War. Uh, this is uh, brought 
fr uh, forward to them uh, in the years immediately afterward. In 1869, uh, Dr. Joseph Lister, a Scottish physician, uh, is the one who first really offers a popular germ theory and more importantly, something to do about it. He's the one who kind of invents List, uh, the Listerian antisepsis procedure. Uh, that is a very thorough cleaning uh, to kill the germs that are on your hands, that are on your instruments, uh, that are in the air as you're breathing. Uh, he's really making the effort to attack the germs, to prevent death by directly attacking the germs. So he's, uh, he's trying to advance this theory, and it's one that had been in development through the Civil War. Uh, the one who first kind of gets into germ theory and how to do something about it is Louis Pasteur, uh, famous for pasteurization. Uh, he starts his research in 1860, or about 1860. Uh, so they are starting to come up with these things, but it's after the Civil War. It's after these surgeons could have done anything about it in the scale of death that they were facing. And it also then carries this implication that, hey, uh, you are responsible. You're responsible for all this death. So Americans uh, are not open to this theory by and large. There are some surgeons, Dr. Woodward, who I mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Derby, who do embrace uh, germ theory and antisepsis, but most of them are really unhappy with it. They don't like this idea. They don't think it works. Uh, and it's uh, such an involved procedure uh, by, by Dr. Lister that it's easy to misapply it. It's easy to do it wrong. Uh, and that then gives the false impression that it doesn't work. People aren't being as thorough, they're skipping steps, and that introduces germs into, uh, into the, the surgical theater. Uh, so this gives the false idea that it doesn't work, and they start to ignore a lot of the other sources that show that it does. So Americans aren't happy about this, uh, and they are rightfully proud. They've just been through arguably the greatest healthcare crisis uh, in the nation's history. Uh, they have seen some terrible things, and they've accomplished great things. Uh, Americans invented anesthesia. They used it on a wide scale. Their surgeons, through experience in the Civil War, are among the best, uh, or if not the best, at amputation in the world. Uh, they've created uh, hospital systems that endure to this day, ambulance systems that endure to this day. Uh, one of the very first civilian ambulances was started by a Union surgeon in New York at Bellevue Hospital, and that ambulance still runs today. That, that, uh, uh, it's now FDNY uh, number three, I think, out of Bellevue Hospital. Uh, so, so they are proud of their accomplishments, but they're also unwilling to hear from these upstarts, people who did not experience what they experienced, uh, and people who are advancing theories that they see as unproven. To his credit, uh, Dr. Lister actually comes to America and tries to prove it to these surgeons. Uh, it's a pretty uh, courageous move. Doesn't work out too well, but He's really trying to advance this theory. He's trying to get the Americans to embrace it and save lives because he knows they can. Uh, he opens by initially saying uh, how great Americans are. Uh, their, their invention of anesthesia gets an, a nod. Uh, he talks about their accomplishments during the Civil War. And then he advances his theory. But the audience is very hostile to it. Uh, one surgeon uh, tells Dr. Lister to his face that he had a grasshopper in his head, which I guess means he's, he's crazy. Um, veteran surgeon of the Civil War, Dr. Uh, Samuel D. Gross, who's actually a really prominent surgeon in this period. He wrote the Manual of Military Surgery for the U.S. Army. Uh, he spoke uh, at Lister's uh, lecture immediately afterward and says, little if any faith is placed by any enlightened or experienced surgeon on this side of the Atlantic in the so-called treatment of Professor Lister. Doesn't even call him doctor. Our own Jake Wynn suggests that it's not until the death of uh, President Garfield in 1881 that the American public and physicians began to turn toward germ theory. The slow and painful descent of uh, President Garfield, who uh, may have been able to survive his wound uh, from an assassination attempt, was very well documented and popularized at the time in newspapers. People were getting daily updates, sometimes morning and evening updates, on the condition of the president. They were seeing his very slow, painful, and unnecessary descent. There were those voices that did embrace germ theory getting louder as this was happening, saying, we can prevent this if we do A, B, and C. The doctors that were uh, operating on President Garfield, himself a Civil War veteran, uh, they continued to practice medicine as they had during the 1860s. 
And this led to his death two months later. So the American public is getting daily updates, sometimes twice a day, for two months. And they watch this prominent man die when he didn't have to. That was a huge turning point for the public. Uh, the 1880s is also when Dr. Uh, Koch, Koch? Uh, again, I'm not German. Sorry, Germans. Uh, he really starts to push his very modern and popular theory of germ theory. Uh, and you've also got rising physicians. You've got younger American surgeons who did not serve in the war, uh, who were not implicated in its bloodshed, that were more willing to accept uh, these foreign ideas that were uh, less likely to see themselves as guilty parties. And this is really when things start to, to turn around. Uh, now, in Europe, there's a little bit more of an acceptance of germ theory. It's, it's not universal. Uh, so I'm not trying to suggest that it's a Europe versus America thing. It's a debate within the medical community. But the balance of power in America is very different from what it is in Europe. You really don't have very many Americans until the 1880s buying into germ theory. And the Civil War is directly responsible for that. In the end, the Civil War is a major setback in American acceptance of germ theory. The conflict unified the American medical community, and rightly so, around their innovations, around their accomplishments, around their experience. But by spreading disease and infection that they couldn't have been aware of, the war also made them largely unwilling to accept their own role or listen to outsiders who had not experienced the unimaginable trauma that they lived through. The lessons for today are pretty clear, and thankfully the world's medical community seems to have learned from uh, lessons like this one. Uh, the World Health Organization, WHO for example, was established in 1948 to prevent uh, failures just like this one. Our own Centers for Disease Control, or CDC, uh, encourages international learning and cooperation. The National Institute of Health shares scientific research and papers from around the globe so that our own American me medical professionals can learn from them and share our knowledge with the world. Just a few months ago, we were visited by one of our new members, a surgeon commander in the Royal Navy, uh, who travels the world visiting uh, military historical sites and medical sites like ours, uh, and tries to apply those lessons to today. So this is a directly uh, relevant part of our mission. We're supposed to carry these lessons to today. Uh, we're proud to facilitate this dialogue. We're happy to be part of this. We're happy to share these lessons, the successes and failures of the war. Uh, and we're happy to have an impact on the, the medical world today. Um, I'm, I'm glad that all of you could, could join us for this. Uh, and I hope that, uh, that you'll consider becoming a member. That's the best way to support us. You'll see the, the link in the description here. Uh, again, I, I see a few members in the chat there. Thank you so much for joining us. I am happy to answer your questions. I know we've got a couple in there already. Um, I also want to remind you again, for those of you who may not have been here at the beginning of the stream, I am not a medical professional. I am a public historian. I don't have a professional or academic experience in virology or pathology. Uh, this should all be taken as educational, uh, especially historical educational uh, entertainment. Uh, so please do not uh, take any of this as medical advice. Uh, if you enjoyed, again, consider a membership. It's a great way to help us. Uh, you can donate as well if you'd like. Uh, all, all things would help, especially while the doors are closed right now. Uh, and I encourage you to visit all three sites once this is all over with. Uh, this is uh, going to be a great way to extend what you're seeing today. Also consider a, uh, a checking out our other programs, our other broadcasts. Uh, we have a near view tomorrow, another one on Monday. Uh, we're trying to put together some, some fun stuff as well. Uh, I'll be taking next week uh, away from my live stream uh, question and answers. Uh, I've got uh, some membership work to do, uh, partly because all of you are supporting us. Thank you so much. But I've got to send out some, some letters, uh, some, some uh, membership cards, journals, newsletters. Don't forget you get a journal and newsletter if you become a member. Uh, so I will not be here next week, but I do plan to be here the following week uh, with, with a brand new exciting topic. Uh, so again, I know we've got some questions out there. Uh, let's see what we've got. Uh, I do have one that was uh, emailed. Uh, these broadcasts coming up and you want to learn uh, about a particular aspect of what we're talking about, send us an email, send us a message on Facebook. Uh, we're happy to answer those questions during the stream, even if it's not asked uh, in the comments section here. Uh, so we had one that, that asked about the effects of the smallpox vaccine. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I think I think I see, I'm going to double check this because I don't want to... Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, uh, I do see Jim Downs in the chat here. Uh, Jim Downs wrote a uh, excellent book called Sick from Freedom. And it's all about uh, the medical treatment of contrabands in the Civil War. Contraband, uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with the term, uh, those were formerly enslaved people who were liberated by the Union. Uh, it's sort of a loose quotes liberation. Uh, they, they don't really get their freedom until emancipation in 1863. Uh, but freedmen and contrabands, uh, they experienced uh, a pretty uh, harsh smallpox epidemic through the war. Uh, and into the years after the war, into Reconstruction. Uh, this goes to the administration of medicine. Uh, there is a smallpox vaccine. I mentioned this earlier in the chat. Um, there was a way to prevent smallpox. Uh, it, there had been forms of inoculation, they called it variolation, going back to the 18th century, to uh, before the American Revolution. George Washington uses uh, smallpox inoculation on the Continental Army. Um, and there's an even more effective version of it, an actual vaccine, by the time of the Civil War. Uh, so there is a way to prevent this. It's just not getting to the formerly enslaved. Uh, there is a massive epidemic uh, that spreads across the South, into the North, into the West. Uh, so there, there is a uh, smallpox vaccination. It does work very well. And it's more about the administration of it. It's just not getting where it needed to be. Uh, and again, you can read about that in Jim Down's book. Uh, Jim is in the uh, the comments here too. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, let's see. So we got a question. I want to get uh, Lynn Bristol. Hi, Lynn. Uh, asks, uh, or rather says, bee honey was used by Roman legions to promote wound healing. Uh, also known as antiseptic, but probably not co uh, correlated with the use of honeybee uh, by the Romans. Is bee honey known to have been used by CSA or Union in practice? Uh, I don't know the answer to this offhand. Uh, I'm afraid I'll have to say. Um, I'm fairly certain the Union did not use it. I'm not aware of that in any of the uh, sources that I've read. Uh, I'm still trying to catch up on my study of the uh, medical department of the Confederacy. Uh, but um, from what little I've done, I haven't seen it there either. If anybody in the comments knows of a case or cases or widespread use of honey uh, as a medicinal uh, thing, uh, that would be great. I know it was used occasionally in forming pills to make them taste better. Uh, it, was, uh, it was more of a, or also a binding agent. Uh, but it wasn't in itself, in those uh, formulations, meant to have pharmaceutical properties. Thanks for the question, Lynn. Let's see what Um, Dustin Gatz, uh, would you consider institutional bias gained during the Civil War an indictment to practicing medicine following the Civil War? If so, how can we prevent that from happening during the development of a vaccine for the coronavirus? Uh, the second question uh, is not for me to apply. Again, I'm not a medical professional, um, but definitely institutional bias is a real thing. Um, the USCT, for example, uh, the United States Colored Troops, that's the official title that's used during the period for uh, the uh, segregated regiments of African-American soldiers. Uh, they suffer from disease at enormous rates, absolutely astronomical. Uh, we have a little bit about that in our museum. Institutional biases is, is a real thing. Uh, and there is a failure to, um, to treat and prevent medicine. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier as well uh, with Jim Down's book, which again, I, I, re I recommend you read. Um, there's also a uh, institutional bias toward uh, rural and poor communities. In the wake of the Civil War, there's a uh, uh, epidemic of opium addiction. And that disproportionately affects uh, adult white males uh, in rural areas and the South in particular. There's a couple of papers on that that are, that are quite good. Um, so there is definitely institutional bias uh, down a couple of angles. Uh, how exactly we use that to inform the present, that's for modern medical professionals to, to determine. Not being a medical professional, for me to say how we fix these systems, I would need to be much more familiar with them. But the lessons are important in themselves. That's the reason we're here. As I said in our mission statement, we're here to, uh, to carry these stories and give them to the people who can do the most with them. Uh, and, and thank you for that question. That's a good question. I'll elaborate on gangrene. Uh, gangrene is an infection. Uh, it's, uh, uh, 
I, I wish I could expand more on that. Uh, I'm not, a, again, a medical expert. I don't know exactly how gangrene works. Uh, I can say in vague terms how it was treated at the time. Again, bromine being a big one that's developed uh, by the mid, midpoint of the war. Um, and also the attempt to, um, to amputate further and further up, to get ahead of it. And then did spread. They did understand that as it climbs toward the trunk of the body, uh, mortality increases. The medical and surgical history shows that uh, finger amputation had, I think, 3% mortality, uh, which is very high for today, but back then it was pretty good because cutting off the leg uh, next to the trunk of the body was something like 83% mortality. So they understood that the spread was geographical, that it did move uh, in a discernible way up the body. Um, but again, I'm not a, vi a virologist. I don't fully understand how that works. Uh, from another group, uh, Jack Rogers asks, uh, how Confederate surgeons were progressing, if at all, during this time in basic cleanliness or even disinfectant procedures? Uh, good question. Sort of by accident, they did make a major discovery. Uh, there's uh, suturing. This got mentioned in my video on the surgical kit. I, I uh, recommend you check that out. Um, to suture is to sew shut. Uh, given how many capital amputations were prefer performed during the Civil War, uh, that's a pretty important thing. Before the war, really through the war, the preferred suture material, the thing that you're actually threading through the flesh, uh, was usually silk. Silk is braided, uh, and those little uh, grooves, those seams, could hold germs. Uh, so you're introducing those into the body. Uh, the body itself can fight it as well because it is not an organic material. Uh, so, so you see more uh, infection from the use of silk thread. It's harder to get in the South uh, because of the blockade. And it's not being produced, again, broad strokes, locally within the South. So one of the things that they turn to is horsehair. To make horsehair pliable enough to be used as a suture, they boil it. Uh, that was purely to make it more pliable. Uh, so just like Woodward was saying, hey, wash the uh, surgical instruments, he's doing that to make them better instruments, not to clean them, uh, not to anti put an antiseptic procedure on them. Uh, but the, uh, the suturing uh, with the horse here does have the added benefit of not harboring those germs because it's not bra braided. Uh, and it's an organic material. It's less likely to be rejected by the body. It still can be. Uh, and uh, by boiling it, you're also killing all the germs that were on it. So they, they did have some progress in that, but just like a lot of these other things I talked about, they didn't understand why that worked. They just knew that it did. All right, let's see what else we got. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Jeff Hilmer. Uh, Mary Bickerdyke was instrumental in making many improvements to soldiers' conditions just by laundering and adding disinfectants. Can you speak on her at all? Uh, I'm not terribly familiar with Mary Bickerdyke, uh, but she, like uh, many women, uh, did improve the uh, survivability of camps. Uh, one of the reasons that the Civil War has especially filthy camps is because uh, it's coming at an era where they've moved away from the role of women as domestics in army life. In the 18th century through the War of 1812, uh, women are an inseparable part of, uh, of army life. They're doing a lot of the cleaning, a lot of the, the um, hygienic stuff that needs to be done around the camp. George Washington, uh, I know this is like the third time I've mentioned him in a live stream or a Civil War Museum, uh, he tried to expel the women from the camp. He saw them as a nuisance. And some of his officers uh, were, were very much recognizing, no, we can't survive without them. They're the ones who make this army work. Uh, so in the Civil War, they have become a, uh, the army has become a basically exclusively male space. Women are no longer in the camps. Uh, and this leads to a, a denigration of hygiene. Uh, I've lived in a bachelor pad. I know what it's like. Uh, it's, it's not a good place to be. So women like Mary Bickerdyke uh, are instrumental in those spaces they're in for improving sanitary conditions in the camp. This is not done specifically because of germs. They, they don't again, really know the connection, but any cleanliness is going to help. All right, let's see. Uh, Trevor Steinbach. Uh, during the Spanish-American War, they wanted Southern men to sign up for regiments since they thought they would have less issues with disease. That's true. It's also true of African-American soldiers. Uh, that's one of the reasons that the USCT suffer from very 
high mortality rates. Uh, first of all, they're being recruited out of uh, places that are perceived as pestilential anyway, Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida, um, coastal areas. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's true. They thought that people who lived in tropical climates were immune to tropical diseases. They are not. Malaria can get anybody. Uh, and, and this is a, a major issue well into the 20th century. Uh, this is also cited as one of the reasons that African Americans suffered disproportionately high casualties in the First World War. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Thanks for bringing that up, Trevor. That's, that's a good one. Um, is the movie The Field of Lost Shoes accurate? I haven't seen it, sorry. It's one of the few Civil War films that I haven't seen. Uh, but uh, actually, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up. One thing that we're playing with, an idea that we might have for a future video, uh, if not live stream, is sitting a couple of professionals in front of Civil War hospital scenes uh, from uh, shows like uh, uh, Mercy Street, uh, movies like The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. That is a Civil War film, by the way. Just watched it the other day. Uh, there's uh, a bunch of Civil War hospital scenes and a bunch of TV shows and movies through the decades. Uh, we would like to go and, and check those out. We'd like to bring in some professionals to watch them and give us their feedback. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, Raria asks, Is it accurate, after germ theory was accepted in the U.S., there was a suicide issue among Civil War doctors? That's a very good question. Um, I have only just scratched the surface of what doctors felt after the Civil War. Uh, and I'd really like to dig in uh, a little bit more uh, on that. Uh, but uh, I can't say for certain that that's what happened. Suicide was a major issue uh, in the decades after the Civil War. Uh, in fact, into the 20th century. I know there was at least one veteran uh, who committed suicide in 1900. Uh, so it's, it's uh, certainly possible. I would not be surprised by that. They've been through the most traumatic experience of their lives. And uh, oftentimes in their memoirs uh, for surgeons and other medical professionals, they'll be recalling decades later and saying they felt like it was yesterday. Uh, they could still see uh, and hear the things that they experienced. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't be surprised by that, but I don't have any solid numbers on that. So we'll have to, to look into it. What else? Oh, thank you for posting uh, explanations of uh, gangrene. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's very important and something that I really should know more about. <laughs> uh, so again, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this was uh, a lot of fun to answer your questions, to see everybody here on the stream coming to us from around the world. Uh, we are here to bring hope. As depressing as this topic is, it is topics like this that inform medical professionals today. It's these, this history is our legacy. We're standing in the shadow of this. And by studying these topics, we can make innovations today. We can avoid the, the mistakes that they made. Uh, and we already are. Uh, if you look at the, the cholera outbreak uh, that, that came to America in 1866, we treated it very differently now. Uh, if we had had the same proportional population back then, did the things that they did back then, we would have had way more people uh, uh, who suffered and died from, from the current coronavirus. We are learning from the past. The past is important, and we are here to, to illustrate that. We are here to bring this to you. Uh, and thankfully, the medical community seems to uh, be listening. Uh, I'm really glad that we've had so many of you here. Uh, so glad to see that doctors make up over a quarter of our membership. Uh, and I'm glad that we're reaching the audience we need to reach. Uh, so if you want to continue supporting uh, these, if you want to keep them coming back, uh, be sure to become a member or send us a donation. Come back at one o'clock tomorrow. Uh, we'll be talking about Camp Lynn. It was the uh, largest uh, field hospital in the wake of Gettysburg. Um, and there's gonna be an interview tomorrow uh, about, about one o'clock. So turn back in for that. Uh, again, I'm so glad you were all able to join us today. Hope you had a good time. Uh, and be sure to check out our website. Uh, we've got a, a lot more videos coming down the pike.